All right, welcome everybody to uh, our next uh, in the series of ISR Distinguished Speakers. Uh, today, I'm happy to introduce and welcome uh, Professor uh, Greg Rothermel. He's a professor and Jensen Chair of Software Engineering at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He's a ACM Distinguished Scientist. And if any of you, probably many of you, have used the SIR uh, Subject Architecture Infrastructure Structure repository. It's a mouthful. Um, that's why we say SIR. Um, with some of those subjects from there, uh, you've used, uh, a, you know, you've you've benefited from the vast amount of works work that it took to curate all of that information and make all of that available uh, to the software engineering community. Um, Greg's also a, uh, you know, he's been on the the editorial board. It, uh, of many journals, ESC, um, TSC, many of the ones that you know. Um, and uh, just on a personal note, I was just going back and I was searching our past emails with, with Greg and I looked back and I was like, oh my, and I was doing the math, I was like, the oldest email that I have exchanged with Greg was back in 96 and it dawned on me, I'm like, 96? That was 10 years ago. And I'm like, no. 20 years ago. <laughs> it was when I was an undergrad. Um, so he's a, a longtime friend um, and a um, well respected scholar. So take it away, Greg. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everyone. Sound okay in the back? Yes. Okay, great. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, glad to have the opportunity. Um, I thought it never rained in Southern California. <laughs> of course, if you know that song, the next line is, it pours, it pours. So that seems to be what it's doing. Uh, the work I'm going to talk about today, much of it appeared in FSE in 2014, and uh, my colleagues, Sebastian Elbaum at UNL and John Penix at Google, were a part of that work. In fact, Sebastian particularly contributed uh, the bulk of the materials toward the work. And I'm even stealing some of his slides, or using some of his slides <laughs> with permission. Um, so I just want to acknowledge them. And uh, OK. Let's see. This one, there we go. Uh, 20 years, some of you who are at lunch have heard some of this. Excuse me, but some of you have. <coughs> so 20 years ago, I was working for a software company called Pallet Systems. We made computer-aided drafting and computer-aided manufacturing <laughs> products. And we'd release a version of the system, and with that release, we'd have, we'd have developed a battery of tests that we would use to convince ourselves that the version was ready to be released. <coughs> then, of course, having released that, it goes into, you call it maintenance or evolution. And we'd have to fix it, we'd produce a new version with some patches for bugs, and then fix another patched version, and then add some enhancements for our customers who were on maintenance. Uh, and that process would go on and on and on, producing new releases. And eventually, we decide to add some new major features and create a new major release. And that would go through the same process. And all of these subsequent releases had to be retested. And we call that regression testing. It's testing to show that the software hasn't regressed or taken a step backwards as part of your changes. Because oftentimes, your changes make things that used to work not work. And also, with changed code, you want to test uh, whether new functionality is correct. So that was 20 years ago. More than 20, I guess, 25. Um, and at that time, we followed a process model, a development process model that was very common. Uh, so I call it the traditional process model. I'm not sure it had a name. Uh, and in that model, um, at some point, you'd release a P. You'd release a version P, point T prime. And then you'd work on it for a while, working toward your next version for weeks or months until you had your changes in. You might do unit tests in there and stuff until eventually you thought it was um, code complete for that intended release. And you'd go into the testing period where you'd run system tests of various sorts until you could release the version. Now, in this model, we, we refer to this as the critical period. It's the period in which all the testing has to be done, or all the VMV activities. And it's usually time limited, because you want to get the release out. And oftentimes, your development period crept in there and stole some of it from you already. So you're trying to get things done in a limited period of time. Uh, as far as testing is concerned, as far as the, the VNV people are concerned, this is a preliminary period where they can be preparing for that critical period, uh, but um, they're not quite under the gun. <clears throat> but during that period, you can do 
a lot of various analyses to make yourself ready for a more productive critical period, like, like gathering code coverage information or, or, or analyzing for dependencies. And so um, a lot of the work in this area depended upon that sort of process model. Now I'm going to tell you about a couple of things we did to regression test. Now, we have this version that we've released, and it's been modified over the period of time, and we have our prior test suite, T, and we want to retest P prime, regression test it. Well, the most common thing to do is bring T over and reuse it. Now, you may need to add new tests as well for the new functionality, but at a minimum, let's reuse the existing tests insofar as we can. And just blindly reusing all of them is called the retest all approach. And that's what a lot of companies did. But at Palette, retest all would take from 8 to 24 hours. And a lot of that was human time. And if you'd only changed some parts of the software, you would think it shouldn't require that much testing time. Um, other companies, takes a lot longer. Uh, some folks I wor worked with at Boeing had a piece of code of 20,000 lines of code that took seven weeks to test. And if you've only changed a little bit of the software, do you need seven weeks worth of tests? Maybe not. So one way to address this is to do what's called regression test selection. And when I left industry and went into academia, this was the first problem I looked at. Um, given that you have a changed version of the program, instead of running all the tests, maybe we could do some analysis in this preliminary period that lets us choose a subset to run. And thus we can test more efficiently and hopefully as, as, as effectively uh, in the critical period. Um, sometimes, though, people don't want to throw out any of their tests, and an alternative approach that, that I looked at a few years after regression test selection was called test case prioritization, where given your modifications, you're not going to throw any tests out, but you'll analyze something about the test to determine which are more important, and you'll prioritize them so that the more important tests are run first. And now if your testing's cut short, you can hope you've run the most important tests. If it's not, you might get to the end of the testing. Or you can also detect things earlier that you might want to detect. If you can put the tests that are better at detecting faults early, you might detect your faults earlier and get about debugging. So these are two techniques that are going to come in to the talk in a few slides again. In the time since I left, oh no, I, I remember. I wanted to show a, a, a brief example of a technique that operates on this uh, kind of traditional process model. And the details don't matter too much, but it was the first test selection technique I created, and it was called Deja Vu. And during the preliminary period with Deja Vu, you could build the control flow graphs, that's what these are, for a program and modified program. And these are obviously very simple. Whole programs would have more. And you could gather test coverage information for your tests. And so this dynamic gathering of coverage at, of information coupled with the static construction of control flow graphs yields this information, all of which can be gotten in the preliminary period, except maybe for the last few modules that change right before the, the critical period. The deja vu algorithm says, I want to find all the tests that go through changed code. And it begins walking these graphs, looking for places where the code changes. So it looks down, no, no, no changes here, no changes here. I marked places where there are changes in green. Uh, no changes here, but looking forward to S4, that's where there's a code change. It's a dangerous edge that leads to a code change. So we're going to select the tests that used to reach it, because in this new version they may reach it. Now we don't have to walk down any further here, because any tests that could get down in there have been selected. We walk the rest of the graph, end up selecting the two tests that reach changes. Test T1, which goes around uh, the false loop doesn't reach any changed code. That's an example of a test selection technique. And the key facets to remember here are, it requires construction of flow graphs and collection of all the coverage information in this preliminary period in order to save time during uh, the subsequent period. That was okay in a traditional maintenance model, because you had a lot of time here. But over the years since then, new models began to evolve. People began to do things more incrementally. For instance, this is kind of stylized, but let's just suppose this is a month. Well, people would start doing their coding during the week and running a batch of tests over the weekend, not waiting this long. Uh, it goes even further. People would start doing nightly builds, nightly builds and tests. We code during the day, we test overnight. What happens here is 
this time you have for preliminary work is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. If you've got long running test suites, you might not be able to collect all the coverage information for them there, and certainly won't be able to collect it there. And so the analyses you can do have to change. You can't afford as much analysis time. But things have taken a step further, which is what I'm going to talk about today, to what's called continuous integration. And the problems become even more intense there. What's continuous integration? Continuous integration, the engineers merge code that's under development with the mainline code base at frequent time intervals. So you've got all these engineers working on the code, and instead of, instead of holding on to it on a release branch for a while and then merging things in, when everyone agrees, you're going to keep merging frequently to the head, or sometimes there are some branches. And many major organizations have started to use this approach. Uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter, open source projects like Firefox. And there are a bunch of tools supporting it. Uh, Travis CI, Jenkins, a couple others. More beyond that. Here's a screenshot of Travis CI. It works with GitHub, I, if, I, if I recall correctly. Um, you can have your projects in GitHub and you can hook up Travis CI. And anytime you commit a bunch of tests in Travis CI will run. And so you're committing and having test run, committing and having test run, committing and having test run. And as they self-report, a couple of days ago when I took the screenshot, they had more than 246,000 projects using this approach. So continuous integration is becoming more and more widespread. Now, what I'm going to talk about most of the rest of the time is continuous integration, or CI, I'll probably abbreviate, at Google. And I can do this because Sebastian Elbaum did a sabbatical there a couple of years ago working with the folks who are doing their testing, particularly John Penix, and learned a lot about continuous integration there, uh, and was able to bring some things back, as you'll see, that we've been able to work with. Uh, at Google, they do automated builds, test execution and notification on a continuous integration basis. And of course, there's thousands of developers and tens of changes per minute. And this chart, a little hard to read the labels, but it's showing the number of test suite executions done per hour across a day. And the numbers here are higher, you won't be able to see them, but that's 5,000, that's 10,000. So these numbers up here are in a single hour between 10 and 15,000 test suite executions. This number here, in this single hour, between 30 and 35,000 test suite executions. Why is that hour so busy? End of the day. End of the, actually, lunch. End of the day would work too, but that happens to be lunch, where you've uh, finished your changes for the morning. You want it's going to take some time to process your test. You want to come back with information. I think it's GMT, which is why it's shifted off to look uh, like six o'clock. <laughs> now, what's happening here is there is a stream of changes coming in, and a stream of tests are being launched in response to those changes. Um, Google has some things posted. There's this uh, thing on Blogspot by uh, Gupta, Ivy, and Penix, who are from Google, uh, from which I actually I probably took their slide and rearranged it. So I think this is probably a slide from that presentation. Thank you. And uh, this is about the speed and scale of really <coughs> testing and, and builds at Google. Uh, they have a single monolithic code tree with code in mixed languages. Uh, developments all on the head and releases all from the source. So they're not working on side branches. They're working straight along on the head. More than 10,000 developers, more than 2,000 projects, 200,000 test suites in the code base. And here you go, 50,000 plus builds per day on average. 20 plus code changes per minute. More than 50 million test cases run per day. So that's speed and scale. And they're doing this in the continuous integration um, process. Here also from their slide is a, is a picture of a basic continuous integration process. Oops. Changed code is submitted. You do a, do a commit to put the code back in the code base. And they do a dependency analysis. So if you've submitted a module M, a changed M, they're going to try to determine who uses M and who is M used by in order to include them in what needs to be tested. And then they determine which test suites are concerned with those modules. And they take those and configure and batch them and send them out to the cloud or to the server farm or whatever you want uh, for the build and test processes to run. 
as they complete, information is aggregated, stored, and people are notified as to the results of their test executions. Now, one thing they noticed at Google, and I don't know that everyone has done this, is that if everyone submits to head this submission, which we'll call post-submit testing, uh, can take a lot of time. And developers wait a while for feedback. Because at that stage, there are lots of dependencies to cope with. You're coping with dependencies in your change code with anything else in the system. And you're competing with others for the resources. Moreover, in post-submit testing, if you haven't done a lot of testing, you may break the build. And you break the build, you're nobody's friend anymore. And nobody wants to break the build. And so what they instituted, and I, a lot of this is reported by me through Sebastian. So Google, if I'm getting it wrong, I apologize. I may have screwed up the communication. But this is what I believe to be true. Um, Post-submit testing can break builds. And for this reason, they added a pre-submit testing phase. And the pre-submit phase lets a developer who's working in their sandbox on something that they think they want to commit, it lets them do a check beforehand. Now, in that case, rather than rely on a, on a large-scale dependency analysis, the developer themselves specifies a change list of the things they think that are really important related to what they're committing. And that's a smaller change list than the full dependency list. Uh, and they submit that. And that's going to provide faster feedback to them, help them detect faults and fix them before they submit them to the official code base and risk breaking the build. So here also from, uh, from the, uh, the page from Google is a picture of that. You've got pre-submit testing where a change code and change list comes from the developer, is configured and batched and sent into the queue of tests. And you've got post-submit testing where <coughs> change code goes through dependency analysis and ends up with tests submitted. And on all of these, you're getting notified and information is being gathered. So there's a lot of testing going on, pre-submit and post-submit. An awful lot, again, 50,000 builds per day, 20 changes of code per minute, 50 million test cases per day. So how do you handle that? Well, someone might say just bigger server farms, larger cloud. But the problem is, the more resources you add, the faster testing increases to use up those resources. You're just gonna run more tests until you've used up the resources and now there are the same delays in getting information. So we wanted to address that. And that leads us to uh, the topic of today, regression testing approaches for continuous integration environments. And as you might expect, we're going to go back to our roots and try and find applications for regression test selection and test case prioritization in this continue integ continuous integration realm. But things are different. First off, in traditionally, regression test selection, RTS, and test case prioritization operated at the level of test cases in an individual test suite. Here we can't do that. We've, what we got coming into the system are test suites being run. So we're going to operate at that coarser granularity level. Second, we can't assume we have coverage information or even time to perform much analysis. So the techniques we used to rely on, like the deja vu technique, aren't going to work. The key insight into what we've come up as first techniques are to use lightweight test history data in the form of information on when the test suites last executed and when they last failed. There's some root, root to this uh, in observations people have made that certain tests are prone to, prone to fail and are good at revealing failures and maybe they're worth running more often. So it kind of comes from that. The intuition here is if a test suite failed recently, well, it may be going through some hot area in the code and we probably better run it again. Also though, if it hasn't failed recently but it's been a long time since we executed it, maybe it's time we gave it another chance, just in case we've been missing something. And in the other case, let's skip it for now. So let me illustrate a way we can do this, this intu intuitive approach. What I've got here is a lineup of test suites. Now, as I said, there's, there, are co there are commits submitted, and this is, uh, this is about pre-submit testing here, where developers submit change lists, and there are lots of test suites associated, but we can line them up individually, and that's what I've done here. So these are test suites. Uh, these are ones that have been executed so far, and these are waiting for execution from here on down. Uh, red ones are test suites that failed the last time they ran. The one we're about to execute is C. What we want to do is ask ourselves, do we really want to execute C? 
or is it one we could meet up? So we introduced two things, an execution window and a failure window, which refers back to the intuition. Again, if a test has failed recently, we want to run it. If it hasn't executed for a while, we may want to run it. So we're facing test C. We're going to look at these windows and try and decide what to do with it. If you look at C, you can see it appears in several places, but it hasn't failed within the failure window. It has failed outside it, but that's not within the window, so it's not a recent failure. Um, and it has executed recently. And so the algorithm says we don't need that. Never mind, throw it out. Next test, P. P hasn't failed recently, but it's been a long time since it's executed. Its last execution is outside the window. So that we're going to take. And we're going to execute it. Test N. No failures recently. It's been executed within the window. No need to do it. Test E. Again, it hasn't failed recently. Again, it's appeared in the window. We'll pass, pass on it. D. Has failed recently. We'll take it. G, I'll stop here. But you can see how that's going along, making the decision based re relatively instantaneously based just on what has happened within these windows. Now, one thing this causes is we end up excluding tests. And those tests, there's no guarantee that they wouldn't have revealed a failure. And that might make you nervous. But our safety net here is the fact that every test is going to be run in post-submit testing. So in pre-submit, we're going to reduce the number of tests we run in order to increase the throughput and get data back. But we may end up delaying some failing tests until post-submit. And, and that may cause us delays. So that's the trade-off going on there. Now, one other thing. In my example, I was relying on information about pre-submit tests to decide in pre-submit whether to run the next test. But we can also rely on information from post-submit tests, which are going on at the same time. So for instance, when I'm looking at G, G hasn't failed recently. Uh, it has been run within the execution window in pre-submit testing, but there's a recent failure in post-submit testing. So in that case, we would take G. Here's the algorithm. It takes T, which is a set of test suites, and two failure windows. And for all the individual tests in T, if it failed within the failure window, it's hot, we want it. If it hasn't executed in a while, it needs a refresher, we want it. If it's new, we want it. And we're going to return it as one of the tests we use. Otherwise, we're not. So that's our algorithm for pre-submit testing. And we'll come back to some empirical data about that in a little while. Now I want to tell you what we were looking at for post-submit testing. Post-submit. We don't want to exclude tests. That's our safety net. We do want to keep running tests. But in post-submit, there's this testing going on, and developers are waiting for a return on results. And if, for failing tests, we can get them results earlier, they can respond earlier. So we'd like to promote to earlier in the runs the cases where test suites fail as much as we can. So the top of this is all the same as the, as the as the stuff on, on uh, test selection, RTS. We're going to do things at the level of test suites. We don't have coverage information or time to perform analysis. We're going to use lightweight information. But there's going to be one other difference for prioritization that didn't exist for test selection. And that's namely this. In selection, a test arrives at the front of the queue, and we make a decision about it. For prioritization, prioritization involves a set of tests, deciding which of this set are more important and which are less. And you can't really decide about one test more important than itself. So we need a window of arrivals to prioritize over. So we'll call that window WP. And we're going to call the, the queue, I should have used a different word, post queue. It really means the queue of things that have been posted and that are waiting to execute. But you'll see on the picture here in a moment. Um, so here the notion is similar to before, except if it's failed recently, it's hot. It should be ranked higher. If it hasn't been run in a while, it needs a refresher. It should be ranked higher. Otherwise, it should be ranked lower. So right now, we're just doing a binary ranking, higher or lower. Obviously, we could look at others, but that's future work. So 
looking back at a similar example, again we have the test suites that are queued up, a failure window, an execution window, a next test. And since we're doing this over time, and we've got this window of tests that were prioritized, we have the window we were currently working on, and we'll say that ends there. Those were already prioritized. And now we've got a new batch of tests that haven't yet been prioritized that fills up WP, and we're going to prioritize those. <coughs> so the way we do this is, I'm going to do this a little bit backwards. I'm going to look for tests over there and decide how important they are there. Actually, algorithm sorts student tests over in WP. But basically, look into the right. Uh, e is in the failure window, and so that gets high priority. B is in the failure window and failed, both of them. That gets higher priority. There's nothing else in the failure window that's over in WP. Uh, P hasn't executed in a while, so any P's in there get chosen. D hasn't executed in a while, any D's in there get chosen. Those are the high priority tests. Put them at the front. So we've just prioritized in a binary fashion the tests that are in WP, and now execution continues with the tests that are there. The algorithm for that looks similar to the test selection one, except we're doing prioritization. And we got a couple extra windows. So we're going to go through all the tests that are in WP, which should be lowercase p, on post -queue. And here too, if they failed recently, or if they need a refresher, or if they're new, they're going to get priority one, otherwise priority zero. And then we take those priorities and sort WP. Does it work? Does it help? Our research questions pertain to the two techniques. How cost effective is CIRTS? And how does its cost effectiveness vary with the different settings of WF and WE? How cost effective is TSP? And how does its cost effectiveness vary? In this case, we just asked about with respect to WP. We ended up picking a fixed value of WF and WE to keep the variables down. To look at this, we took advantage of another thing Sebastian was able to get from Google, which is what we've called the Google Testing Data Set. And actually, he, with people at Google, put this together and made it available on the web, and you can find it. Uh, what it is is three and a half million test executions gathered over 30 days for a portion of the Google product. Uh, it's not actual tests. You can't run the tests. But it's information about how long they took, when they were executed, which may be multiple times over, those, over that month, whether they passed or failed in a given execution, and how long they took. And what you can do with this is simulate testing. You can say, well, if I ran them in this order, how early would I have gotten the failures? If I ran them in this order, how early would I have gotten the failures? So that's what we take advantage of. Uh, to give you a little more data on them, pre-submit tests constituted 42%. The other 58 were post-submit tests. Um, I forget how we classified small, medium, large. There's something in the paper about that. But the vast majority are what we call small, and fewer are large. But the, uh, the percentage that fail increase as a test gets larger, which makes some sense, because a larger test runs into more things than it could fail on. <coughs> overall, if you looked at overall fail rate across all the test suites, it's a rather small 0.05%. So usually, test suites succeed. Our variables in this, the independent variables for research question one, our technique, our technique, CIRTS, retest all when you run all the tests. We're trying to obviously save over that while doing as well as we can with respect to it for failure detection. Uh, and random, which may, mainly randomly selects test suites of the same size as CIRTS. So we better be able to do better than that. Uh, we chose some values for WE, the execution window, and for WF. Uh, we, feel, we felt like WF should take precedence and some, how, how often something has failed. Um, we should look at relatively small grain things, whereas, whereas uh, the gap at which you'd consider picking something because they haven't executed in a while should be larger. So that's why we ended up picking these. What do we measure? Well, we're interested in the percentage of failures we detect, the percentage of the test suite we have to execute to do that, and also the execution time for the test that we select. For the second question involving prioritization, the technique is the prioritized suite and the unprioritized, the order it came in. 
And for WP, remember that window in which we prioritize? We chose several levels. For WF, we just picked 12 and 24, which seem to be, well, from the study of RTS, seem to be reasonable choices to look at. In this case, all we're looking at for a dependent variable is, is the delay in exposing failures. We hope that with our tech prioritization technique, there will be less delay. You'll get the failing tests earlier. The study operation. Uh, Sebastian implemented CRTS and CTSP in Python. I'm glad he did. I haven't implemented anything in years. But it only took a few hundred lines of Python, apparently, to do. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, he could simulate the techniques by walking through the Google bases. So threats to validity. Those of you who have been doing this a while know that in empirical study, there are these things we call threats to validity. But for those of you who are a little new, an empirical study is not a proof. We get a sample of things from the world, from the concrete world. We're going to experiment on them. We haven't proven that what we're doing holds for everything. And there are some other problems with studies, too. And it's very important in a study to spell out what the threats to validity are. Think of it as limitations, things that limit the extent to which you can draw conclusions. So some of the major ones for this study, which you'd find in the paper, external validity is about can we generalize these results? Well, in a large extent, we can't. We chose only the Google data set. How could we say this would hold for another data set? Uh, we only have a few baselines, retest all, uh, random, uh, unprioritized. There could be other techniques to compare against. We had to cho choose a certain set of window sizes. Others might yield different results. And we're paying no attention to available computing infrastructure, by which I mean the number of servers you might be able to run things on. We're simulating this as if we're on one server. Internal validity threats. In an experiment, you've got your independent variables, the things you're varying, such as your techniques, and your dependent variables, such as their effectiveness. And what you're hoping to be able to do is see whether there's a causal connection between those independent ones and the dependent ones. If in your experiment you messed up and there was something else that could have caused your results, that's a threat to internal validity. It could lead you to conclude that your treatments caused a difference when they didn't. Okay? Now, a couple of potential threats here. If Sebastian had made implementation errors in his little tools, we might get results that don't represent what we should get with correct tools. He tested them. We don't think that exists, but we want to say that it is a possibility. The second thing, though, is, is, is this thing that we call flaky tests, and there's literature on this now. A flaky test is a test that behaves non-deterministically. You can run it one minute and it'll fail, run it, run it the next and it'll succeed. They do exist. Google data set has them. Other data sets have them. They're non-deterministic for some reason. And we don't really know in this Google data set where the flaky tests are. So we're drawing results based on information about tests that were seen to fail or succeed in the past. But that may have been due to flakiness, not due to exposing faults. And that's something we just can't address. So. Uh, construct validity is about the measures you choose. Uh, we are measuring costs in terms of percentage of faults detected, percentage of tests executed, how long they took. But we're not measuring anything in terms of engineering time or, or how long we've delayed the engineers in their tasks. Okay? And so relationships may differ. So these are some things to keep in mind when assessing the results. But now let's get to some results. We're looking at RQ1 first, regression test selection, Remember, that's applied in the pre-submit phase. What I've got on this graph, this is for WE 24 hours. Okay? And this represents different choices of WF. Remember, we had, what was it, 0.5, 1, 2, 4, oh, 4, that's way down there, uh, 12, 24, and so on. So that's different WFs. This is the percentage. It's a percentage. For the diamonds, it's the percentage of execution time relative to retest all. Uh, for the pluses, it's the percentage of test suites executed. So for example, uh, with WF equal 24, we were executing executing a little over 20% of the tests. And it took a little more, it was a little more than 20% execution time. Uh, time and number tend to closely track each other, or pretty closely, although the time gets a little larger as you get out toward the larger WFs. So 20% of tests. How well did we do for fault detection? That's the uh, drum roll, please. 
here's the percentage of failing tests. You can see at the low values of WF, even there, you're detecting a much higher percentage than the percentage of tests you run. And it quickly goes up. So by the time you get here, running 20% of your tests, you're detecting 72% of the tests you could have detected if you ran all the tests. Did I say tests? 72% of the faults you could have detected if you ran all the tests. It doesn't go up too much higher. By the time you get to uh, WF equal, I think it's 96, you're running roughly 25% of your tests and detecting 78% of the faults that you'd have detected if you ran 100% of your tests. Still, a lot less effort for, there's quite a gap there. You're getting a lot more bang for your buck with your tests in this case. And remember, the ones that don't get executed here will get executed in post-submit. So we haven't lost them completely. Uh, here's the, compar <coughs> excuse me, the comparison with random. Random down here. So if you randomly select a test suite from the whole test suite, a, a, a set of test suites me, um, of the same size as the ones that are algorithm selected, you'd get this fault detection. So obviously, there's something about our technique that's elevating the fault detection. It, there's something valuable about looking at recently failed tests or tests that haven't executed in a while compared to randomly selected. Uh, if you want to compare the, uh, the WE values, here's 24 and 48. And they're the same graphs at the bottom. Uh, on 24, that's what you were just looking at. On, as you increase the execution window, things go down a little bit, but not a lot. Basically, WF has a, plays a much larger role. The failure window plays a much larger role in the execution window uh, in, in kind of the tuning of the technique. How about prioritization? Um, I'll show some overall data in a minute, but this, this small graph lets me explain something. Um, Remember, we tried WP at different values. Okay? That's the window over which you're prioritizing. I've got, what I've got here is a sequence of 40 failures. I mean, as you're running on the Google test set, lot of things fail. This is failure number 5857 to failure 5897, just a slice of the data. And this is showing the time the failures were detected in hours since we began running things. And the 5857 on this curve, which happens to be one of the prioritized test suites, the 5857th failure was detected at hour 13,050. And using this technique, it was detected at hour 13,100. So it's showing some delay between techniques in terms of hours. Okay. Now, WP equals zero is shown here in a solid line. WP equals zero is the same as no prioritization, running them in unprioritized order. And you can see that Everything else is always below it, except for a couple little spots here. So mainly, in general, all the instantiations of prioritization outperform no prioritization. They all let you detect faults, at least particular faults in this graph, in this small range, um, earlier than you would if you didn't prioritize. But there's large variance between the techniques. It's hard to know which is different. They all cross each other at different points. Here's a different way of looking at it. It's, this is the, the gain in hours over no prioritization. Here's the zero point. And what we'd like to do is detect faults faster to gain in hours over no prioritization. So we'd like to be above that. Uh, this is the different WP values. And of course, this is all the, the distribution of values. So do this. if you look at the medians, and all the instances of priority are above zero. From the point of view of medians, okay. But at the low FWP values, you have a huge variance, and there's a lot of occasions where you might as well not have prioritized. But things begin to stabilize a little out here as your WP values go up, and you do a little better, and you have more instances where, you're, where you're gaining some time. So we regard this as, as, as kind of a minor success. It's a success, it doesn't seem on any grand scale. The success with RTS seems better. We think we need to do some more work on this. But it is going in the right direction. It's letting us detect faults earlier than we would have if we hadn't prioritized. Right, I, I just said that. So some discussion items about what, I've, what we've seen here. I, the big notion comes from the results of CIRTS. Is it good enough to execute 70% of your failing test suites with 20% of your test, 
execute 70% of your failing suites with just 20% of the overall suites executed? Well, given that it's pre-submits, maybe it is, because you're going to run them again later. The tension here is that you can reduce your execution time, and you'll get more throughput on these pre-submit tests, but you'll delay fault detection on more tests. And how, how much of a delay? Hard to know for sure. But if we looked at the latencies between the last pre-submit and first post-submit across the Google data, it was between 1.2 and 2.5 hours. So these tests that you put off, you might be waiting 1.2 to 2.5 hours more to get information on after you've submitted to head in the post-submit phase. And so I, my understanding is that uh, when this information was shared with people at Google, some groups said that's okay, and some said it was not, given the processes that they were using. Some for bike and some did not. Uh, some of the risks can be managed by finding the right settings for WE and WF, which is something we need to work on. Uh, another piece of data, when we used RTS, I showed you on the slide, we can look at pre-submit data and post-submit data. Okay. Uh, we tried that for test case prioritization or test suite prioritization too, but looking at, looking at which on which we do on post-submit, but looking at pre-submit didn't help that much. And that's probably because Pre-submit testing, often developers are being kind of exploratory about it. And the information you get is a little bit misleading over the long run. So for that, we continue using just post-submit information. Another thing we observed that we haven't done anything with yet is uh, code can fail, but also can test suites. These, their test suites are written in X unit-like frameworks. And the test suites themselves can fail and need to be modified. And that's another source of information, perhaps, for prioritizing. I mean, if, if the uh, the code, if, if the test suite is exposed to failure, that's one thing. If the test suite itself has failed and needs to be repaired, then maybe that's a candidate for re-execution too. So that's something toward future work. But a couple things I mentioned. We need to think about the distinction between true failures and flaky failures. And think about what happens when we have large computing infrastructures and large numbers of nodes to be firing these tests out onto. There's related work on this that I won't get into due, due to time. The paper has much of it discussed. But uh, I will say that, that most, of the, most of the work is recent, 14, 15. It's been coming out just in, in recent times. Well, conclusions. The CI testing is no longer discrete and bounded the way it used to be. Things are coming in too fast. Uh, and, and testing approaches that assume it is discrete and bounded aren't going to scale or keep up. Uh, we need to be able to perform essentially instantaneous selection and prioritization and analysis. And it appears that our approaches can help, but we've really only done the one study with the Google data set, so we shouldn't say too much about that. Workflow integration can be critical, though, because we're just looking at these techniques and how they interact with engineers and help engineers do their job is going to be a critical component of whether they'll be accepted by engineers. So that needs to be studied. What are we doing now? I'll have a little bit more detail on two of these items. We've started additional studies. One more slide coming on that. We'd like to improve the techniques. One notion for regression test selection is rather than use these windows, with a window, you might have a test that failed, and suddenly it gets outside the window, and suddenly it's not important at all. It's kind of abrupt changes. And the same thing goes for execution windows. Well, if we use decay formulas, which are formulas weighted with exponents, uh, we can, we can kind of cause things to gradually become less important or gradually become more important. And so we're working on formulas that can work for that to improve RTS. Uh, for test suite prioritization, we've got that post queue and it's a fixed WP and there's tests already out there and we prioritize and then that's it for that queue. Well, we might learn something as that queue's going along that would cause us to shift things. So rather than a one-time prioritization, if we could dynamically adjust orders based on things we learn as we go along, that might improve things. So that's another uh, topic for future work. Um, window sizes affect how well techniques work. Throughput changes across the <coughs> week or across holidays or whatever. <coughs> Maybe you can adjust window sizes. Now that applies adaptive techniques that monitor something about how the testing's going and adjust window sizes to keep some um, objective met. Uh, there's also other variants of CI processes to think about. Uh, I already mentioned handle flight test suites and consider larger computing infrastructures. Just two more slides about 
about some of that ongoing work. Um, we've gotten a second, shall I call it, experiment subject from Travis CI. It's Ruby on Rails, some of you may know of it. Um, it has a large number of test suites, 5 million test suite executions, a large percentage of which pass, just as in the Google test data set, a large number of commits. And we can mine that data, set it up the same way as the Google test data set, run the same approaches on it, and having done that with the same values, here are the graphs. They look remarkably like the Google data set graphs. This is the percentage of failures detected. This is the percentage of execution time. So this is a completely different subject under completely different circumstances, and the results are coming out relatively similar to those uh, on the Google data set. So that's the first step in trying to generalize the results. Oops. Variants of processes. There are other variants of processes out there. One I find particularly interesting is one that was reported in the paper listed here, reported as being Firefox's relatively new process. Now according to the paper, and, and I'm all going according to the paper here, uh, Firefox used to have a situation where you have your main line and you, if you want to do something, you'll branch off a version and work on that for a while, maybe work on another, and eventually you merge them into the source. And, and they found that cumbersome and did away with it. And instead, decided to use four different channels, they call them, in the paper. The nightly channel, Aurora, Beta, and Main. The nightly ch and, and they segment this into six week periods. The nightly channel um, is worked on just by developers putting in new features. And they do that, and in six weeks, the features from nightly that seem stable are promoted into Aurora. And in Aurora, in six weeks, the features that we've decided are going to make the next release are promoted into beta. And then in six weeks, the ones that can make it get into main. And so you're gradually promoting things that are seen to be good enough to lower uh, channels. The other thing going on here is the users. Up here, there's still a lot. Up here at this channel, there's um, 100,000 users, mostly developers. The ones they promote down to Aurora, they say the users go up tenfold. There's a million there. Excuse me, a, yeah, a million there. And that's 10 million, and that's 100 million. But, you know, far better that our errors here, where we haven't done as much testing, are in a position on a million people than on 10 million. And so you gradually get more exposure to users and gradually get more information. Now, if you're doing <coughs> continuous integration here, you've just multiplied your sources of information by quite a lot because errors that happen down here should affect the test you run up here. And so different processes are going to require uh, different approaches as far as running tests on. And this is only one that's, that's kind of interesting and there are others out there. So if there's another moral, it's you can come up with an approach or process, but often one size doesn't fit all because there are different processes out there. And if you come up with the one and present it in a talk at a conference, someone's going to say, well, we don't do it that way. We do this. You say, yeah, one size doesn't fit all. Your process is important, too. And uh, we'll have to look at that differently. Okay. And that's the end. <coughs> Thank you. Yes? So it, it strikes me here that you have uh, a very interesting problem that's kind of analogous to like the Netflix recommender problem or other big data problems. That is to say, you have all this data and you have past data and you want to predict the future from that. Which which test should I run based on mm -hmm. what I've seen in the past? Yes. And you came up with a couple of hypotheses yes. that beat the naive approach quite yes. well. Yes. But what you actually need to do is generate a zillion different hypotheses because you have an excellent objective function and tons yes. of data to test with, right? Yes. So you want to maximize the amount of failures yes. and minimize the amount to run. Yes. So shouldn't you feed this into a big data engine or, or a deep learning engine or something like that, and it will come up with some algorithm. You may not even understand why that's mm -hmm. the algorithm, mm -hmm. but it may say for, for this data set, this is the best predictor yeah. of the future, and it may be yep. the weirdest algorithm you've ever yep. seen. It may say, you know, if it's raining on Tuesday, that's you, you should run these test sets, and, and that's what it comes up with. You can maximize that objective function. Yep. So, so why try to refine your human hypotheses instead of just letting a computer generate a zillion hypotheses and, and answer that question? We, we do intend to head. Okay. That's the direction we intend to head. Yeah. We want to do that with the decay measures because we think that they present more opportunities for adjusting them. And for right now, we've been playing around with different decay algorithms to see what happens with them. But once we got a stable base on those and know what some of the relationships are between them, 
then essentially that's what we want to try. We want to try and, and let some system tell us here are combinations. Remembering, of course, that that the comedy. I mean, this go, this goes to an important area with different companies and different faults and types. Of, it's going to vary for different places. So we really need not one fixed technique, but a technique together with an approach for determining how to tune it for your particular organization. So that's where, why we need what you're saying. So one thing I did not hear you talk about at all was oracles. Mm -hmm. And not only where the oracles come from, I'm, I'm assuming the person that makes the test makes the oracle as well. Yes. But is it the case with Google that the variance in the amount of time it takes for an oracle to execute does not is not high, whereas in your original job with the uh, cab company, uh, if there's an oracle that maybe intrinsically requires a human, yeah. that could be enormous variance, yeah. which would certainly affect your your windows. That's you, quite true. Is, yeah. how, can you comment yeah. on that? Um, my understanding is that. They, they are doing automated oracles within their X unit like tests in most cases. Um, Sebastian made a statement about there are some cases where they don't have those. So that would add a lot of variance on those cases. And there you'd want to be starting to treat test individual test suites differently because you know they have different costs. Um, but that's that's about all we've done toward that so far. It's a good point. If, if you've got a lot more variance in the test due to differences in types of oracles, that's not factored in here at all. Yeah. Um, so, do you have any information as to uh, the types of failures, the severity of failures that are missed um, by doing uh, pre-submit uh, as opposed to retest all of the yeah. post-submit? No, we don't. We have this kind of raw data. It says nothing about severities okay. in there. That's another good point. It's kind of related to uh, to Dick's point because we're just we're kind of treating all failures as equal. Of course, some failures are more equal than others, and. Uh, need to be treated differently. So if one knew that, one could, could come up. There's, in, the, in the old time prioritization literature, there were techniques that, that were said to be cost cognizant and failure cognizant. And, for, and they would treat tests that were more expensive, e.g. due to human oracles, or, or failures that were more severe uh, differently, and thus try and factor that into the order. Right now, failures and tests are all being treated equally. Yes? Uh, I'm curious about the, the overhead of this uh, selection um, process because um, I like to use these tools that um, that automatically run the tests whenever you save your file, right? And so, yes. like, I mean, could this be could this be applied to some of those tools to make that that kind of thing run run faster, or is it yes. not not real time enough to to handle that? Oh, I think are you talking about say non CI processes where you're? Yeah, I, I'm talking about yeah, like. Um, like a, a, a really quick test or driven development process where like you make a change run test, make a ah, change run test. Sure they could, yeah. And so. Yeah, it would kind of be, um, I'm reminded of, I mean, you could be in your own sandbox, you're doing your development with, yeah. and you've got test first development, you've got all these tests, and it's, you're, you're not even doing anything about dependencies. But you could do that there. There was an interesting paper a few years ago by, uh, I forget the student's first name, Saf and Michael Ernst. Um, that they were looking at what they called, and this was before CI came up, continuous, they called it continuous processes, but if they were thinking of it as a developer making these changes all the time, and could they, in between the changes, run a bunch of tests, which goes even a little further than what you're saying. I mean, hype a little, I'm thinking, run some tests, hype a little, run some tests, and then you'd want to prioritize them and run them and give you some information. I haven't seen that followed up on, but that, that goes toward that. You could apply that potentially in this context. Yeah. Yes? Using such a lightweight approach made a lot of sense when you had a lot of tests to run. Yes. Uh, and that's great. Uh, is there any scope for using such approaches successfully for uh, scenarios where you don't have so many tests to run? Uh, and particularly, uh, running them instead of using the more heavyweight data flow based approaches. So can we, in other words, can we disregard data flow, data flow based approaches for regression test selection? or test reprioritization? Uh, well, I, I would say that um, if, you're, if, you, if, you can, if, if your test, testing takes a certain amount of effort, and if you can afford that effort, then you don't need selective testing or prioritizing. Sure. You can just run all the tests. Now, whether you can afford it may vary. If they're fully automated tests with fully automated oracles, that's one thing. If there's a lot of human time involved, you may want to cut down on the human time because engineers are more expensive. So the, the cost factors can be complicated. But 
I certainly wouldn't say everyone needs to do selection or, or prioritization you know, if your testing is currently fitting into your current process. Oh, no. I'm saying can you avoid something like data flow based ah. regression test selection yeah. in favor of you know, using an algorithm that, that is as simple as this? Um, I, you could. I suspect that Will it do I suspect that data flow based <coughs> selection would uh, have a better success rate at finding the tests that reveal failures. Or there are so-called, well, the first technique I showed, the deja vu technique, if your tests are deterministic, it guarantees finding all the tests that reveal failures, and it can still reduce things. So that's a more heavyweight technique, but it's one that if you can afford to run it and, use, and collect the coverage information, you can ensure not leaving anything out of the test suite. So yes, there are others where if you can afford them, you can use it. Do we have uh, any more questions? I'll, I'll, I'll ask a final question. So it, um, I notice two trends going on currently. One is the ISTA software testing and analysis community. It seems like there's more and more of a desire for more and more complex algorithms that's got heavier duty analysis. And, and those are the only things that will be accepted into that community. And simultaneously, there's work like this that's saying, you know what, we could do, we, we can improve things quite a bit, and in fact, make it much more practical in real life. Mm -hmm. um, do you see those ever coming back into alignment? Do you think that the, that the research community will start to appreciate <coughs> more things that may actually have more um, practical potential? Crystal ball, crystal ball. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to frame that a slightly other way. Based, okay. If you don't mind, it's just based on something we talked about earlier. Um, there does seem to be a tendency in ISTA FSE these days to insist on full automation. Yeah, I'll, you'll send this paper in and they'll say, oh, but it requires manual effort. Well, the prior technique was 100% manual and you've reduced 80% of the manual effort. Why isn't that helpful? I mean, do we need to be resisting on full automation? If we can, can help humans do something faster, more effectively, that's a good next step. I was reading, there was a book on the development of computer science, really, that talked about, um, oh, it started back in the age of uh, Love, Lovelace, and then Babbage, and then um, um, Turing, and went on up through the major advances. And somewhere in the 40s or 50s, when, when computing was really, when people were building the first mainframes, um, there were people at that point who began saying, hey, these things are eventually going to be intelligent. They're going to take over the job of thinking for humans. We'll have artificial intelligence. Humans can go draw pictures or something. We'll, we'll be the intelligence. And there was a whole other camp at the time, <coughs> again, this book says, uh, that I think Vannevar Bush, the founder of the National Science Foundation and many things, uh, was involved in, who said, why are we striving to make machines that do everything for humans. Humans have a lot of creative spark that machines are never going to have. Why don't we strive to make the machines and the algorithms help humans do the things that they do better and faster? And that means it's, there's, there's humans are still in the loop, and it's not full automation. <coughs> and so I'd like to say to the people in the ISTA who, who, who say it needs to be fully automated, no, we're helping humans do better by giving them information they didn't otherwise have, and now they're more effective and more efficient. And the things that are best left to humans, such as maybe deciding whether the test output is correct, can be left to the humans if we automate these other things. So that's my view on that. Um, will All the right. community come around? <laughs> <laughs> that's a perfect place to stop. Well, let's thank our speaker again.